Um, uh, I, yeah, apologies at first for my for my grammatically incorrect uh, uh, play on words. My presentation is called "To M or Not to M." I'm going to talk about uh, the addition of a micacin to piperacillin tazobactam in hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, no, and uh, sorry, the slide. So not yeah okay so uh, to start off with the case this is a 49 year old female who presented to Hot Secure Hospital um, during the COVID third wave uh, several weeks ago. Um, her background she did not have any previous medical history. Uh, was HIV negative and had a three day history of uh, symptoms consisting of cough, fever, loss of taste and smell, and also reported some vomiting and diarrhea. On physical examination. Um, uh, she had a normal uh, cardiovascular system exam, and it was noted to have bilateral course crackles uh, with some respiratory, with some tachypnea, um, and had sets of 94%, but did require nasal prong oxygen. Um, on anterior blood gas, uh, her PaO2 was 8.4 um, kilopascals, and, and her SARS-CoV-2 antigen was positive. Uh, an assessment was made that she was having COVID pneumonia, and she was managed accordingly. She was admitted uh, for treatment with oxygen and uh, uh, clexane and steroids. Um, this is just an overview of her admission. Um, uh, initially, when she was admitted, she was uh, not febrile, um, but as she progressed after about uh, 48 hours uh, in hospital, she had a, yeah, which was noted to be a low level fever, fever spike it was actually only 37.9 degrees. Um, uh, but that coincided with some deterioration of her respiratory condition. She required um, a mask oxygen on that third day. Um, and uh, based on those results, uh, a chest X-ray, uh, which was done at baseline shown on the left, was repeated on day three and showed some worsening consolidation, particularly on the right uh, middle zone. Um, um, in the ward, the assessment was made that because this was fairly early in her, um, in her disease history, she was only day six of symptoms at the point in time when she had the, the low-grade uh, fever spike, uh, that, it would, uh, that it was COVID likely to be just be due to COVID pneumonia. But a concern was raised that this could be a hospital-acquired pneumonia uh, superimposed as well. And for that reason, a blood culture was taken and she was started empirically on IV piperacillin, tazobactam, uh, and amikacin. Um, and I should note, though, that blood cultures were already taken on baseline at day one as well. And when those blood cultures were, uh, were negative, she was actually taken off her antibiotics uh, again. Um, but uh, I found this interesting because the question of, of how to treat hospital-acquired or presumed hospital-acquired pneumonia often comes up in and out of the COVID wards. And in many centers in South Africa and abroad, uh, to empirical treatment that is then often given is, is consists of piperacillin and tazobactam uh, plus amikacin. Um, however, uh, some other institutions or practitioners may just give piperacillin and tazobactam alone and leave out amikacin. Um, and I think uh, I've, I've heard several arguments being given for and against. Um, so the argument for is obviously that uh, um, the coverage of Piptes and amikacin is broader, but the argument against is that amikacin is noted to have poor penetration into bronchial tissues and that um, yeah, would therefore be of limited benefit. And I think it's an important issue. I myself was practicing in the rural areas before where Piptes and amikacin is kind of always combined without much thinking into uh, why. So that's kind of what I wanted to review for this presentation. So I'd like to start off by just going through some of the guidelines. These are the, the American ITSA and ATS guidelines for hospital and ventilator-associated ventilator pneumonia. And these guidelines actually state that if we look at the top left, that in patients that are not at a high risk of mortality and with no risk factors for MRSA, um, uh, piperacillin tazobactam monotherapy is actually recommended as uh, seen in the green. And um, in case of a high risk of mortality, uh, we should look at the third column on the right in red, where then you would qualify for piperacillin tazobactam uh, with the addition of an aminoglycoside. And it should be noted that here a high risk of mortality 
uh, consists of either needing ventilator, ventilatory support or the presence of septic shock. Um, European and Latin American guidelines are a little bit less specific about which treatments and combinations should be given um, and uh, stress the importance of local susceptibility data more in selecting for optimal uh, um, empiric treatment regimens. And their recommendations are basically that monotherapy with any beta lactam is, uh, uh, um, is acceptable or appropriate and uh, beta lactam is acceptable if uh, that agent would cover over 90% of pathogens encountered on the local antibiogram. And that combination therapy is preferred in case of either septic shock or if the patient is deemed at high risk for MDR uh, organisms. So uh, yeah, this brings me to the basic overview of the, of the considerations for addition of omicacin to piperacillin tazobactam. So as said, the main argument before is that the combination of piperacillin and tazobactam and amic would provide better cover, particularly a double agent empirical cover for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and would also have a better likelihood of covering for particularly gram-negative multidrug resistant organisms. Uh, the point of uh, there potentially being some synergism is also often raised. Um, points against would be the sub potential suboptimal penetration of omicacin into lung tissue, and also the fact that you can't just add additional treatment for free because this would come at uh, additional toxicity, mainly renal for the uh, amino glycosides, and would come at an additional risk of selection of uh, antimicrobial resistance. So for this presentation, I want to focus on the two main before and against arguments. And I would like to just start by uh, talking about the um, argument for better cover first. So uh, let's talk about the antimicrobial coverage of Piptaz and amikacin. Um, there's no head-to-head -head comparison uh, RCTs available that I could find that compare Piperacil and Taze back to monotherapy versus the combination of Piptaz and amic for hospital acquired pneumonia. Uh, these trials are available for neutropenic uh, sepsis and um, intra-abdominal infection, and their uh, differences are actually not really encountered, but that's outside of the scope of this presentation. Um, there is some indirect, indirect evidence, though, that adequate antibiotic coverage is important in hospital acquired pneumonia in general. And this is from a study performed a while ago, published in CHESS in 2005, that showed that in patients, uh, non-ICU patients with hospital acquired pneumonia, inadequate initial empiric treatment is associated with increased mortality, uh, which kind of stresses the point that whatever we give should cover the uh, organisms that we think are responsible for the infection uh, immediately. Uh, and this kind of brings us to the point that we really need to know something about the local antibiogram in order to say meaningful things about which empiric treatment should be selected. Um, so that brings you to the question what the local antibiogram is at Grotesque Hospital. And uh, with the help of Chad Sedner from Microbiology, um, we did some quick data harvesting uh, from, uh, of data at Grotesque Hospital to just answer this question uh, briefly. We selected patients in Grotesque Hospital from January 2019 to December 2020 and looked at isolates from tracheal aspirates. So this is mainly uh, patients with either VAP or tracheal aspirate uh, colonization uh, of the trachea with certain organisms. We do do deduplicated uh, the isolate records and selected only the first aspirate for each patient and uh, uh, found a thousand um, unique entries in the database. Um, so just some methodological notes, we kind of looked at susceptibilities of these isolates to PIPTAS and then the combination of PIPTAS and AMIC using breakpoints break defined by CLSI um, uh, reference standards. Um, again, the data is probably more representative of VAP and colonization in the ICU and not hospital acquired pneumonia per se. And uh, many thanks to Chad for his help. Um, this pie chart gives us an overview of the prevalence of, of isolates in tracheal aspirates at Grotesque Hospital. And what you can see is that in, on the right, A. Balmani and Steph Aureus are responsible for, for quite a large part of the prevalence. And on the left side, we can see that Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and other, other enterobacterales are uh, responsible for 40% of all isolates in total. And that's the group I'd like to focus on for now. Uh, 
for these three groups of organisms, we did some, um, some analysis of the susceptibility patterns. Um, these are the susceptibility data. Uh, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa on the right, uh, almost 80% is sensitive to PIPTAS alone, highlighted in blue. An additional 10% uh, is sensitive to either PIPTAS and AMIC. Um, uh, for Klebsiella pneumonia, though, their prevalences are very different. Only 63% is sensitive to PIPTAS alone. And, and, there's, and there's quite a large gain when AMIC would be added in, in terms of sensitivity. And then for other antibacterialis, the picture is a little bit more like that for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, just to note, and Chad can answer some questions about this, um, hopefully uh, this is a very simplified presentation of the actual susceptibility data, which is far more complex, obviously. Okay, so that brings me to the other main argument, the argument against, namely that uh, the penetration of amicacin into lung tissue is suboptimal and that therefore, even though amicacin would provide better cover when added for PIP tests, uh, to PIP tests for hospital acquired pneumonia, in theory, in practice, it doesn't really matter because you can't get high enough concentrations in the target tissue. Um, so some general points about amicacin lung penetration. Uh, so the putative mechanism for an antibiotic to work in, in, in case of pneumonia is that the, the drug needs to come from the circulation and then penetrate through the bronchial um, uh, epithelium if this is intact to get into the mucus layer where it can then exert its antimicrobial effects. And it's important to note that the bronchial epithelium is actually not fenestrated and um, uh, contains many tight junctions and that therefore paracellular transport doesn't really occur much and um, uh, antibiotics need to travel through the cell itself. Um, however, amicacin is a highly polar drug and therefore there is almost no passive transmembrane diffusion. Um, I'm not sure if there's any more recent data on this. I just found an old um, observation that uh, at that time it was thought that transport through cells is likely through endocytosis mainly because there are no specific transporters and concentrations were found to be very low in cell cytosol for aminoglycosides, but higher in lysosomes, um, which would um, indicate endocytosis uptake. Um, and uh, luckily I did find one human in vivo study where amicacin uh, concentrations in bronchial fluids were, um, were, were analyzed in vivo. Um, this is the study uh, published in the Journal of Intensive Care Medicine in 2020, so fairly recently, uh, from Iran. Um, this study uh, looked at eight participants, all uh, critically ill adults with a ventilator-associated uh, ventilator pneumonia, who were initiated on empiric antibiotic treatment, including 20 milligram of kg per day of amicacin. Um, and they were excluded if they had any contraindications to either amicacin or bronchial alveolar lavage. Um, so in these patients, amicacin was sampled from the serum at one and two, uh, four and six hours after infusion of the drug. And a, bro a bronchial alveolar lavage is uh, performed at two hours after infusion. Um, amicacin levels were measured using immunoassays, both on serum and in bronchial alveolar lavage and using a, a testing of urea in both bronchial valvular lavage fluid and serum, a dilution factor was established to account for the dilution uh, that occurs when you do a bronchial valvular lavage. Looking at the patient characteristics in the study, um, yeah. just to note that these were all male patients, uh, 57 years of age with a preserved renal function, relatively high Apache and SOFA scores. They were all mechanically ventilated and their reason for ICU admission was predominantly surgical or neurological. Um, if we look at their MKs and levels, um, then uh, please look at the, the numbers in the, in the red circle. Um, the mean corrected uh, um, um, concentration in the bronchial alveolar lavage fluid was seven milligram per liter. And if we um, take that concentration as a fraction of the Cmax in serum, uh, we arrive at a penetration ratio of 10%. So meaning that the maximum uh, 
um, level that you can achieve in bronchial uh, secretions is about 10% of the Cmax in syrup. And the authors note that this concentration is actually below the MIC breakpoint of eight milligram per liter as reported by them in, in half of participants, which would be low. Um, I'd just like to quickly compare this for us to get a picture of bronch to, to bronchial secretion penetration of, of other drugs. Uh, for gentamicin, the penetration ratio into the bronchi is 32%. Uh, for tobramycin, one study showed that the penetration ratio is 12% for that drug. And for piperacillin, uh, the penetration ratio, which is calculated differently for that drug is, is 54%. So there is a big difference between aminoglycosides and piperacillin there. Uh, so just to conclude, um, if we look at tracheoaspirate samples from Hotskur Hospital, the addition of amikacin does provide additional cover for some of the isolates that we encountered, but we don't have direct data on HEP. Um, we need local antibiograms to inform treatment selection empirically for osteoacquired pneumonia in, in this setting. Uh, and if we look at amikacin levels in bronchial secretions, then one study shows us that these levels are actually low, which would be a concern for efficacy um, in this set. I'd like to conclude by just thanking everyone for your attention and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much indeed, um, Lucas. If you could just stop sharing your screen for a minute so that we can um, have some discussion. Um, yeah, okay, so um, thanks very much. That was a, a really nice presentation. Um, and I think you know you've highlighted some of the the issues with the data that we've got. Um, just to say that you know when we looked previously um, at using blood cultures for our gram negative um, bacteremias, obviously you know, the blood cultures being slightly uh, slightly better uh, a better marker perhaps you know of a, obviously of infection rather than just colonization, but you know, a, a good samples, then again, we saw the same sort of thing that you didn't get uh, close enough to 100% with either piperacillin or amikacin alone, but when you combined them, you did um, get close to 100 as well. You had very good coverage. So that's what was behind our, our thinking of choosing piptazamic as a carbapenem sparing regimen um, for gram negative infections. I think the other thing to say is that, you know, in your, as you mentioned, these were tracheal aspirates, so they're probably more, um, they're more indicative of a of VAP than, than HAP. Um, and, you know, in, ha in HAP, you, you may not expect to see so many patients with pseudomonal infection, perhaps more with the intrabacterales than in, in VAP. Um, and, and lastly, to say that I think, unfortunately, um, HAP is, is overdiagnosed, or the term HAP is, is used too loosely in our, in our setting. When people talk about hospital-acquired infections, they may intimate that there's a, a pneumonia, but actually when you look at the chest x-rays, there isn't evidence for pneumonia. And what you're really dealing with is an undefined clinic, a source for uh, a potential hospital-acquired infection. So um, piptazamic probably is a you know, pretty good because we're not always talking about pneumonia, um, thinking about all the issues you've talked about with acid, um, the acid uh, environment in, in bronchi and in, in the lungs. So that, that's just some initial comments, but I, I, I wonder, Chad, if, um, uh, thanks very much. I really appreciate, uh, we really appreciate your help in getting this data together. And maybe you could uh, make some comments first, then we can open it up and please uh, colleagues do raise your hand um, if you'd like to, to make a comment. It'd be great to hear, particularly from our microbiology colleagues as well, other colleagues as well. Thanks, Chad. So, yeah, I mean, obviously um, it's difficult to differentiate, um, you know, hospital acquired infection and um, community acquired infection um, in, you know, sputum samples. Um, 
and uh, the, the 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 reason we chose the 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 tracheal aspirates was because they tend to represent you know patients that have been ventilated and therefore been in hospital, and like you say, um, you know they could therefore have you know resistance uh, rates are overrepresented, pseudomonal rates are overrepresented. Um, but the other thing to bear in mind is that a lot of even those patients and probably a lot of the HAP or HAP inverted commas patients are also, um, you know, they, 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 um, the infection is caused by their own flora and stuff, aureus, haemophilus, strep pneumonia, and, and they don't necessarily need hospital cover. And it's, you know, very much overkill to get piperacillin and never mind the amikacin. Um, so if you look overall at numbers of patients, what your incremental yield is with, you know, amikacin becomes even lower. Um, the other issue is that um, the reporting of the ESBLs, because we don't have the MIC data easily available um, for piperacillin, and um, we came to a consensus with Tigerberg that um, we would not report piperacillin susceptibility unless the MIC was four or less. Um, but the data that, that we've just... Um, presented as 16 or less. Um, so that would apply for, let's say, um, about um, 70, uh, 47 of, um, let's say a quarter of the enterovectorales um, that were presented um, might have had an MIC um, higher than four, which it would be the threshold that we'd, be, we'd use for reporting and therefore probably for using. Okay, Chad, I'm not, uh, yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure if we'd lost you or if you, you'd finished that. No, thanks very much. Um, are there any other um, points from uh, Elizabeth or um, Amanda, Nasli? Uh, or any other colleagues? I don't have any other points, Mark. Um, okay. No. Thanks very much. So, um, Lucas, can I ask you your thoughts on whether this patient, your patient, should have got antibiotics in the first place? Yeah, thanks, Prof. That is a very important question. And um, um, uh, I, I think, I think, um, oh, uh, uh, this 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 the situation is obviously often encountered in in the COVID wards. I think in this particular case, what struck me is how how early in her disease course she was, and and I think particularly in the first week, um, you know, the fact that you're febrile, which she wasn't actually even, um, can is perfectly explainable by by COVID itself. So I'm I'm not sure if a watch and wait approach. Would have would have made a little bit more sense here. I think it I think it did, but I think the clinicians were sort of um, also pushed into a corner because she also deteriorated rapidly, which obviously again is likely just to be the COVID. But um, I thought it was just an illustrative case because this decision is has to be made in this way, um, yeah, so often. Um, but yeah, no, definitely, um, yeah. That's why I did want to note that the, the clinicians were also quick to stop again when the baseline culture was, in fact, negative. Which, of course, is totally illogical, though, isn't it? Yeah, that's true, because they, they actually thought it would be a hospital-acquired infection, and then, uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. obviously true, yeah. yeah. Okay. So from a stewardship point of view, that's the, that's the problem, the breakdown in logic, because if you're suspecting this is a community acquired bacterial pneumonia and you're going on a back on on a blood culture result um, that's one thing if you think it's a hospital acquired infection then it doesn't matter what your admission blood culture shows um, because it's you're you're proposing that there's a new infection i mean i think also the chest x-ray didn't show any actual sort of air bronchogram consolidation it just showed a slight worsening in the covid pneumonia and it was her oxygen requirement that was increasing uh, that was necessary. And unfortunately, it reflects the fact that, you know, although there's only 7% pooled prevalence for bacterial co-infection COVID, eight, over 80% of patients in hospital get an, an antibiotic. And, and so I, from a stewardship point of view, I don't, I wouldn't, if it had been me, I wouldn't have given um, uh, antibiotics at that stage and, and certainly not uh, Piptas and the case in. But th thank you, Lucas. I really appreciate um, the work you put into that. And, and it's, a, it, again, interesting. But I think also does back up um, our 
general approach to um, hospital acquired infections with a carbapenem sparing regimen of adding amikacin in these cases, particularly as, as I've said, the actual diagnosis of, of a pneumonia um, is often missing. And in general, the amikacin does seem to, to bring some added benefit. Okay, um, we're going to uh, continue the meeting and hand over to